the, the clothes we wear, wear almost, they impact um, our lives and our body minds in very specific ways and often detrimental ways when society is set up to function in a different way. So I think that's one of the things that really stood out to me in this book was just this common thread that ran through what otherwise is a very diverse range of experiences. Um, and I think putting this book together um, for me was quite cathartic, I think in terms of realising um, that, not just realising, but I guess reaffirming that this was not a problem with me <laughs> as an individual, but it was a problem with this maddening world in which we exist in. And therefore the solutions, the way that we survive our distress has to be about changing, interrogating, dismantling the structures in this maddening world and making it a more livable space. Does that answer the question? Yeah, <laughs> really, really good. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of pose a similar or a question to you, Chloe, around how you feel telling your story as part of your uh, book as well, um, around wellness. How important has that been in um, just addressing your own kind of feeling and approach towards uh, your own mental health and well well-being, um, and I, I guess by extension, others? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think advocation comes up a lot for me, you know, dealing with my own mental health or my own well-being, um, you know, it helps me advise or at least support other people. Um, and that's community-wide, that's on a professional level, um, it really does vary. But what I have learned is that, oh, I feel like I'm just going to mimic everything he says, <laughs> but, um, you know, that a lot of this does exist outside of ourselves, but when it comes to wellness, I think it's an action that we can take. It's, um, uh, it's almost like resistance, basically, it's saying, you know, okay, this is what is happening. These are the stats, but here is what I can do. And it's an action that I'm going to take. And it's not, it doesn't have to be this massive thing. It doesn't have to be this overwhelming change. It doesn't mean that our whole life, our homes, our families, our communities, all of these things, they don't need to change drastically. They can just be small changes that are consistently made over time that actually contributes to a bigger change, a wider change. Um, and that's what I've seen, you know, from making sure that I go out every day. It sounds really, you know, small, but making sure that I get out, making sure that I'm nourishing myself, making sure that I'm connecting myself to nature, not structures, not institutions, but connecting myself to the nature that's around me. You know, yes, some of us live in what seems like concrete jungles or like concrete structures or concrete homes, but, you know, there are green spaces. We can have access to them. We can actually even own some of these spaces and just having that kind of mentality and that vision and that hope, it does make a change. And I think that is wellness to me, is making small changes every day for yourself as an individual and then doing it and bringing more people into the mix. And I, the best way to do that, honestly, is to live by example. And that's why I've grown a community. I, it just came out of an idea. I didn't think anyone was going to follow me. I didn't think anything was going to happen. Fast forward five years, I would never imagine that I'm here with a book that says my name on it. Like, I would never imagine it, but I just felt that something had to happen and something needed to change. And I was prepared to do that for myself and bring, like, open my arms up for other people to join. And it has changed. It, it's a global thing that we've done, you know, we've done events across the UK, the US, I want to say the diaspora, we're collectively bringing people in to that vision. And you don't need to pay to be a part of it, you just have to believe in it. You know? Incredible. Yeah. 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 I think um, just kind of weighing in and picking up that thread um, about what you can do and what you are doing as, indivi as an individual um, and as with your community as part of a group of individuals and kind of tying that back into that coming out of you telling your story and sharing your story and Samara curating a group of stories. Um, and it, um, I know with your um, book, Psychosis of Wellness, you kind of start off with a bit of a story of your childhood uh, and some of the things that you went through as a child, which clearly have informed, you know, the work that you do today. 
so I think I'd like to also ask you the same question around how storytelling for you and you telling your story has um, fed into um, your experience of um, mental health as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Um, so one of the things... I was, someone asked me this question the other day. One of the... As, as, a, as a way of uh, writing, actually storytelling is a really interesting way. Again, different to academic writing, which doesn't usually do this. So actually telling stories is quite a good a way to bring people in. Right? Actually, this book in particular has a lot of, when I say autobiographical, but stories, um, things that, that happened, right? Things which, and sometimes that's the best way to think through um, systems. So for instance, uh, what was this? Um, I, I keep trying to get fired from work, but they won't fire me. So <laughs> I, I keep telling this story, they'll fire me eventually, I think. So <laughs> one of the stories in the book, uh, which ties into mental health issues, I had a, I had a um, experience with me and a black colleague at work. Um, my, our manager is a white woman, and she was lying about something. So I, I, I said she was lying. She did not like this at all. Um, I didn't shout it. I just said, look, you're lying. Like, you know? I thought it, I was quite calm and reasonable. I thought, <laughs> anyway, she called me aggressive. I was like, oh, hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> so I, I just intervened and said, come on, that's race, racialized language, I'm not taking that. Her response basically was to jump out of the, she ran out of the room crying. There's no way to tackle her. Honestly, uh, uh, and me and my colleagues sitting there like, what, what just happened? <laughs> she, what, honestly, what happened? So I, I assumed that because I had a witness, I'll be fine, right? We, we complained. No, 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 the white tears, white tears trump everything, believe me, geez. So they pursued me for like a year and a half, I had to go to the media about it, it was ridiculous, right? And then I'm, I'm getting quite upset about this, I had, had, had cancer and it was a stressful time. Um, and I went to my mum and she looked at me and she said, that's what being black is. I just walked up. <laughs> I said, okay, thanks mum. Yeah, that wasn't what I expected at all. <laughs> but, but it was a good... It was, it was what I needed though, it's what I needed honestly because I got carried away in thinking that as professor I'm going to get treated better, they're going to listen to me, come on, that's not how these things work, no, this, this is, I should have anticipated that this was what it's going to be, but instead I'm fighting, 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 getting myself, and, okay, I don't want to say I'm getting myself, I mean I, had, I was legitimately upset, but the way that I responded to it made it worse, because I expected something that I was not going to get, and that's what my mom was trying to tell me, that it was dumb. and this is kind of what the, this book is about, say look, it's not fair, it's not right, but that's the stuff you gotta go through. And you have to find your I don't find I don't find my this is why I don't really use Professor too much and <laughs> I don't I don't I don't have my well my well being and my sense of self is not derived from my employer. It is a hundred percent derived from places like this outside, etc. Et and that's what keeps me going. And I think that's what we have to all understand. You try and look for this, look for recognition in these white spaces, and that's that's the end of you, honestly. I think you probably would hear uh, if you were to tell this story again elsewhere. I'm sure some of the feedback might be en end up being something along the lines, and I think this may be true possibly of all of you that oh, you know, these are isolated experiences, you know, um, it happens, you know, get over it, and so on and so forth. And so I think when we're thinking about the structures, um, certainly for me, it struck me, especially in the editorial work that I've done, where I've um, edited, edited for um, people writing about childbirth, you know, right the way through the spectrum, education and all sorts of different um, topics and subjects. And um, one of the things that strikes me every single time I edit some work or indeed read some of these works is um, the various statistics uh, and statistics you know we will say well maybe a person is you know exaggerating or whatever it is in terms of the story that they're telling but the statistics don't lie right and so um, I wondered if each of you maybe you could start with you Kend and then just come around in terms of the different statistics that have come across your um, you know across your plate as you kind of research for your books um, and this is really not to kind of be salacious in any way or to kind of because they are upsetting um, when you when you think about them when you read them I know every time I read them I just was like this is it's almost too much you kind of have to close the laptop go and take a walk and then come back and continue because they are shocking but at the same time I think it also is really important when it feeds into the conversation around gaslighting 
and how many of us can feel gaslighted when we try to tell our stories when and we we hear that they we feel that they're being minimized in some way so maybe from an academic perspective perhaps a wellness perspective and um, you know maybe a medical perspective perhaps the three of you could share just a little bit about the sorts of statistics that you've uh, come across uh yes i guess i mean researching this stuff is so many you know, so terrible and that's why there's so many jokes in the book because honestly if you don't laugh honestly you just it's, it's so heavy um you kind of have to um i don't know like there's the english language you can't spell slaughter without spelling laughter which tells you something about english <laughs> that's, that's the, language. Um, the one the, the the most shocking no the most what shocking one of the surprises i saw was that so if you break down uh, mental health um, so not, uh, section people are likely to be sectioned so black people are about seven times more likely to be sectioned but when it's black other and the black other category we don't know too much about but the assumption is black other is like third generation people who don't not necessarily relate to Africa or the Caribbean black British you could say black British that category is like 15 17 times some really high number likely to be sectioned right and I was actually talking to um, David Haywood. So David Haywood had a, had, a, had a psychotic episode when he was younger, was sectioned, and he, um, we haven't started, we were talking about, well, what, what is this, why, 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 why is this? And it got me thinking, because he was, is his book, Maybe I Don't Belong Here, excellent book, strongly recommend. And it really is about trying to get recognition in, in, in Britain. And I think that's the problem. Honestly, like, honestly, there's a, there's a um, W.E.B. Du Bois, American academic, um, talks about double consciousness so always trying to be an american and a negro and it's not it's not possible because they're two warring ideals but i love malcolm you know i'm actually writing a book about malcolm right now and <laughs> malcolm says look you're not american you're not british there's no for me there's no double consciousness i'm black i just live here you know there's no there's you'll never hear me say i'm british i'm not trying to reconcile britishness with blackness mm -hmm. That's that's that, that that's what that is something that that will drive you. England will mad you, as um, Linda Quasi Johnson says. So I think part of that lesson for me is similar to the work thing. <laughs> which try, which when you try to put two things together that can't go together, this can cause huge problems, right? And actually, as black people, we need to understand that we're more than Britain. We're just here, like Caribbean, Africa, diaspora. That that is what sustains us, and we should stop trying to fit into this box that that really is not for us. Did I hear you say something, uh, perhaps in another interview, about um, a noticeable uh, positive effect on the mental health of students who took your class? Was did I? Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. You talk, you talk to so. Um, you talk to well, some there's a there's a lot of statistics that yeah. university students are um, black university students much more likely to have anxiety, stress, drop out, etc., etc. But when they come to us, it's different when they come. We've had actually had students who've done other courses come and do black studies. And it's, it's a diff different, different experience, different in the way that we, the way that we, I mean, our, our university is unique in the fact that we have six black members of staff in the same department. Most universities probably don't have six black members of staff, <laughs> full stop, unless they're cleaners or security. I mean, that is how universities are terrible, honestly. Um, and so that helps, but then also the curriculum, the, the stuff that you're learning. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, it's a, and that just shows you that when you do it differently, we can be affirmed, but you have to find in those places in some of that university is almost it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And so you have to then when I go and talk to students, I talk to a lot of black students, other universities, you essentially talk tell them how to survive. How do you survive this space, not how do you thrive in this space? The two very different conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think similarly there are so many statistics about how you know black people are more likely to have force used on them when they're um, in psychiatric institutions, more likely to be put into seclusion and all these kind of things. Um, I guess one stat that kind of stands out to me as well, um, and it kind of highlights, I guess, the intersections and the interlinking of these various structures, um, is about the role of the criminal justice system and how that interplays with the mental health system and how much the two mirror each other. Um, and um, I'm not very good at remembering numbers, which is... I struggled with that, with that when I was a doctor, but um, the section 136, it's a piece of mental health legislation that allows you to take someone who is in mental health crisis from a public space to a place of safety. Um, place of safety until recently included the police uh, prison cell. Um, 
But I remember working on a psychiatric ward um, um, in East London, and probably nine out of ten of the people brought in on that section were young black men. Um, and black people are more likely to have their first interactions with mental health services through the criminal justice system than they are through their GP. Um, that might change might have changed recently, I don't know, but that's kind of been the long-standing statistic. And in many ways, you know, the psychiatric system, it mirrors the criminal justice system, the use of force, the use of seclusion, punishment and reward, separating people. I mean, if you're on a locked ward like I was, you know, you can't even leave the building without permission to even go outside and have some fresh air. And I think one of the things that's always frustrated me about the mental health conversation in the mainstream, and one of the things that kind of, I guess, also drove me to kind of do this kind of work, was how sanitized the mainstream mental health conversation is. Um, you know, you see adverts from Dove talking about people's, you know, journeys with eating disorders and anxiety and depression. And, you know, wonderful, those are all things that, you know, that I've had experience with. But the reality is for black people, for people of colour, you know, a huge part of our experience is this punitive um, st structures that criminalise blackness, that criminalise black bodies, black minds, and see them as something that needs to be controlled and contained. And so a part of, you know, talking about black mental health um, is about thinking about how we can have methods for black liberation, white modes of um, black collective healing that don't include these structures, that don't require us to be locked up and caged up the way that we have been done for decades and centuries, but actually can we form healing communities um, that allow us to be free from the stress, regardless of mental health diagnosis or not. Um, and I think that's, that always kind of brings back to me kind of why we do this work. Um, and I guess my role as someone who worked in a system in which I was complicit, if I'm honest, in perpetuating that system of incarceration and control and thinking about how in my day-to-day -day life and more wider in my community, I can kind of create those healing spaces outside of that setting. Um, so, sorry, not, there's not much laughter in that one, but <laughs> but I think um, it's, it's just a good reminder that, you know, these structures don't exist in silos. You know, they're a part of this wider structures that we're in, in which, you know, we are placed at the bottom of this hierarchy and are told to stay there. Wow. Um, I will just want to say that, you know, when I did a lot of the research for the book, I really struggled to find stats that focused outside of the ones that you mentioned. Um, as I said, I was writing the book between the years of 2020, 2018 and 2020. I really struggled to find extra stats which focus on being black and being UK based. Um, a lot of the stats were US based. If I even wanted to, you know, dip my feet in and, you know, find out what is it like being black and British, uh, black and, you know, living in Germany or one of the other places across the diaspora or where you find people across the diaspora, um, it was a struggle. Um, and there was a point where I just felt really disappointed to the point where I had to put down the laptop. I had to step outside a few times. I had to actually tell my publisher that I just need to stop. I don't know if I can like complete it um, because it hurt too much um, realising that, you know, to get these stats and to find or to get the research and be able to share it actually requires a lot of money. Um, and the fact is that not a lot of people care enough to do the research. Um, once I realised that and kind of comprehended that in my mind, it, yeah, it made me feel really upset, um, to say the least. But I think what I took from it after, because you have to recover, the show still goes on. Um, I couldn't throw the book in and say I'm not doing it anymore. This, the contract doesn't allow me to do that. So <laughs> I was like, okay, so, so what am I going to do? Yeah, so I did, you know, I did what my wellness and my understanding of well-being I, I figured out how to you know continue going and I had to take some time away but what I discovered on my way back to writing is that I have to use the lack of research I have to use the lack of stats I used to have to use the stats which are you know really offensive to put it quite plainly I have to use that and 
almost be empowered by it to not only change that but to find more to encourage people to um, know the process of like putting together research um, we need to take that information and do better with it it can actually help us knowing what is currently out there and collectively trying to do better with that information rather than being depressed by it because sometimes I felt as if that was the point I you know after writing this book being a business owner it was like International Women's Day yeah it was earlier this year um and I read a stat that black women are however many times more likely to start businesses but we don't get the funding we don't get the support we don't get mentorship we are blocked from so many different avenues when it comes to the business process that our counterparts aren't and yeah again i was upset but i was like okay cool well now that we know that we need to do better and that was something that i shared with some of the other collectives i have um friends that have businesses and like this is what the stats are by next year we need to do better we need to do better. We need to contact the people that are doing the research, McKinsey, whoever's doing it. And we need to say, speak to us. Come and find out what we're doing in our businesses and do better. And I think from what I've seen, that was in March and we're now in November. I know for sure a lot of people within my space and my peers have been contacted. And hopefully by next year, we have a better set of st um, stats to work on. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, thank you for starting and, and continuing that conversation. Um, it really strikes me that, you know, when we're talking about structures, um, it's more or less any and every structure that you look at around us that's affected. Um, and I just wondered really just in terms of us as service users um, and kind of people could come into these spaces and come into contact with these spaces, and we've heard quite a bit about advocacy and being able to advocate for yourself. Um, I guess my question is, what happens if you are or feel unable to advocate for yourself? And I think obviously having these kinds of stats out there um, through your books and in the public sphere, and I think you're, the part of what's important about your books is the fact that it, it gathers a lot of these statistics into a, a, a digestible space. Um, and, you know, it's one thing to read one book with these stats and if you pick up another and it's, you know, has the same uh, kinds of stats and a third, that can then make you kind of start to sit up and pay attention and think, okay, so then my experience is not, I'm not experiencing what I'm experiencing in isolation, there are others like me experiencing similar things. So I think my question is around, that definitely is empowering. But then what would you say to the person who doesn't feel that they have a voice or they don't feel that they can necessarily advocate for themselves within these spaces? What would you say to that person? Um, I think I'd say that's okay. Um, I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous that we ask people who are at their most vulnerable to do the biggest thing. Yeah. You know, you you are at your most vulnerable, and then suddenly you're meant to, you know, draw upon this wealth of knowledge and information that you may have accumulated over time, and present that in a manner that the practitioner sitting opposite you is going to receive, and then translate into something that then allows you to get the care or the services that you require. Um, and I think that's when you know advocacy groups and community groups are so so helpful and so important. Um, I live in South London, that drive. Does amazing work with you know supporting the community in various mental health services um i know i don't have any children yet but i know when i do i'm going straight to five times more because i've seen the work that they do and i know that if i that they will be able to impart their wisdom their insights even just their care and comfort to me as i go through that process and a process in which i know that i am at you know higher risk of many many adverse outcomes and my child would be as well. So I think, you know, part of this healing, I think, is to throw away the notion that we have to do things by ourselves, this kind of individualistic approach to our care and our survival and our well-being. There is no reason why we must do this as independent silos. You know, when you're vulnerable, you should be able to draw on others. So I would hope that, you know, 
we're not all going to be in that vulnerable place at the same time. So when I'm feeling good, I can support you. And when you're feeling good, you can support me. Um, and I think that's kind of the approach that I've been taking and I hope to continue to take. Yeah, I'd also add to that is that we have to take community responsibility for these things, right? And I think that's, when you look at all these statistics, I promise you, if, you, if you're waiting for NHS or the government, then that, this, this, that's, we're going to have these same statistics in the next 30, 40 years. And one of the things we did better in the past was we understood you couldn't rely on the state. And we have to understand that now. Right? We have to take responsibility and say, look, we didn't create these problems, but we have to solve them because ain't no one else going to solve them. Which is why it's really important we're thinking about it. it's about collective, it's about community, it's about organisation, so that we can support people who are in these situations who can't support themselves. Um, but yeah, and I'm old enough now that when I'm looking at the things which are happening, that's our fault. What, what, what are we doing? What, what, are, what are we putting in place collectively to make these things to make these things happen? So we are, that's why we, in fact, that's the message of this book. Really, 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 all that goes back to Back to Black. It's really a prequel to Back to Black. Back to Black was saying, look, we need to build organization. You need to have a revolution. We need to do things collectively. And I was actually listening to Malcolm X, because I'm writing a book about it. I mean, I listen to Malcolm X anyway, like before I go to bed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was listening to Malcolm. I was reading something of Malcolm, and he said, um, "The biggest problem we've made, the biggest, the biggest mistake we've made, is we tried to organize people who are asleep. First, you need to wake them up, and then once you wake up, then we, then we can do the work. So this book really is the wake up. Listen, this 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 is terrible. It's really bad, but we can build something else. So that's what we're really trying to encourage people to join around the organization of Black Unity, create our own different spaces. That is the solution." So I never think it's not possible because it's definitely possible. We just have to we just have to decide that we're going to organise and build alternatives. Um, and as proof of that, as someone that has followed and supported five times more, you know, um, even before I found out that I was pregnant, um, when I started and when I discovered uh, five times more, of course, they were five times more. By the end of the pandemic, so after I had my son in twenty twenty one, it actually went down to four percent. So that shows that collectively we can make change you know there is strength in numbers and the more of us that know about five times more and all the other charities the more that we talk about them the more that we share those resources i had my son and i use resources from five times more i got a breath work um not breath work the uh antenatal course during the pandemic through five times more and it was free and it went down from 400 to zero so you know these resources are out there but it does take a collective support so if you know about it click on their page like their page share their page make that a regular thing and you will see a difference it might not take years it might just take six months if collectively we're all doing that so i just wanted to add that that you know it does work yeah amazing where would you say that we are in terms of, um, of course, everyone is aware of, um, you know, 2020, the events of 2020, not talking about <laughs> the pandemic, of course. Um, but just in terms of our general, there's always kind of, we look back and we look at, you know, the 1960s and you know, the civil rights movement and so on and so forth. Um, and when you're actually in it and living through it, it's only going to be in 20, 30 years time that people look back and say, this time now. So in terms of where we are in, I suppose, a collective movement around advocating for mental health for black people and people of colour. Um, and I think I'd quite like to keep that within the UK. Kind of where do you see or feel that we are in terms of that movement? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason I don't know is because I guess you know, I guess collectively in the UK, it's hard yeah. <laughs> right now. Um, you know, in terms of, it's hard in terms of the policies that are in place and the politicians who are putting them in place. It's hard in terms of the cost of living, um, which is even a ridiculous term when you think about it. Why is there a cost <laughs> of living? Um, and um, I think, you know, all of the enthusiasm that the public caught on to in 2020 as we expected has dissipated um and you know the influx of money has you know largely dried up um and i think in some ways i think i guess my my optimistic spin on it is that 
Okay, now we've got the nonsense out of the way, let's get back to the real work. Um, because in many ways that fanfare was a lot of distraction and it was a lot of noise um, and people, um, what's the word? Show, but not showboating. I can't remember the word I'm looking for. They were pretending to care, <laughs> essentially. Um, and now that pretense is kind of, it's no longer popular and it's kind of back to the real hard, mundane, unattractive work that it takes. Um, so I think in that regard, I think there is momentum there, but I think um, I personally, I mean, I, I have depression, so maybe this is just my depression. I do struggle to kind of keep the hope in mind and keep that, you know, bright future that we're trying to work towards and craft um, in, in my um, vision. Um, I do struggle with it. And again, it goes back to community because that's when my community kind of reinvigorates me with that hope that I need. So right now it's looking a bit cloudy, a bit hazy. I'm not really seeing it, but I'm, you know, I'm drawing on my community to help me keep that in mind because I think when you step back and look at, you know, the work that was done before me and before them and the people before them, um, you realise that it's not in vain and we must continue. Um, but I think, yeah, the general struggles of day-to-day -day life do make it a little bit hard sometimes. But I'm, I'm thankful for those who nourish me despite it all. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think like just a, what is definitely true generally, we're actually taking a step back. I think in terms of race, there's something the government is way, it's worse than it was in 2019. I mean, it's actually gone backwards mm -hmm. and it's getting even more worse. So the next but one prime minister, put a bit on this, will be Kemi Badenoch. <laughs> you have to, you black? You don't want a black female prime minister? What's wrong with you? Come on, <laughs> front, front. Oh, That's talking about psychosis. <laughs> but, but, but there is a silver lining. There is a silver lining. In, in, Tell us the silver lining, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the silver lining is that I think now we can see through. Right, so like as terrible as Kemi would be as prime minister, at least it would show the look, representation. That's not what you want. It's about what's the policies, what the check, what, and you cannot rely on the government, right? The sewage report, um, sewer, sorry, the sewer, sewer report. <laughs> it's my, um, it's my favorite government report on racism. No, honestly, because remember the what's it called, the other one? What's that white guy did the report? 20, McPherson yeah. report. Yeah. Everybody's all happy and stupid racism. That, that was terrible. That, that, I've had that quoted back to me to tell me that what happened wasn't racist. No, no, no I'm sure it was racist. But no, no, McPherson report. <laughs> so that was way more damaging because we thought it did something good. At least with Sue, we, we know it's wrong. Everybody got mad. You're all angry. At least Kemi bad enough becomes prime minister. You're all angry. It's agree. Anger is what we need. You should all be mad and see through the through. And I think what you see with young people now, and you saw it in the protests, Although, like I said, everything else has gone backwards, but the young people haven't. And I think yeah. we're in a place where we understand we need to do our own thing. We understand we need to push forward our own. And that's really the key. So I, the, there's definitely, definitely, definitely optimism in that, I think. Mm. Yeah, I don't agree. Sorry, I have to agree with everything you said. I do think it's more of a community support. Um, I do feel as if there's been a lot of, like, I call it tokenism over the last couple of years, and it's it's dropped. I feel like the last Black History Month, if we were looking for a lot of noise, we weren't going to get it. Um, and like you said, if we look at if I look at Black History Month when I was younger, I felt like it was more rich. It was more real. We learned a lot from it. And what I always say to people is, and what I've done in my career, is I'm not I'm not asking anyone to validate me or to accept me I, I think i had to learn and i think it these poems encapsulate i guess the role of liberation and freedom when we think about um, mental health and black mental health so the first poem is called disclaimer i do not mean to make psychosis seem romantic but neither will i accept that the experience is tragic let's just say it is part of what happens when a universe discovers it is wrapped in human fabric. And the second poem, Self-Discovery. When I tell you that aliens have implanted chips in my head, or that the CIA is leaving microphones under my bed, that I think I am Jesus, don't get caught on the metaphors. Don't try to take my poetry and fit it into your theory of psychology in an attempt to calculate how far away I am from the normal way that a human being relates to itself. Don't lock me into your definitions of mental health. 
No, I don't actually think that I am Jesus of Nazareth, who walked the desert for 40 days and brought salvation through death. What I am trying to communicate is that I now recognise myself as important, as having a cross to bear, as a being made of love, as a being with a great purpose, as a being with a strong spirit. So don't get upset when I refuse to let you convince me that it is irrational to feel like a god, when I have finally encountered my divinity, when I have promised myself to no longer let the demons, the CIA, the aliens, my negative thoughts, win in their attempt to put out my fire, win in their attempt to silence me, or turn me into something I don't want to be. So when I tell you that I am fighting the aliens in my head, that I'm getting rid of the microphones that the CIA have put under my bed, that I feel like Jesus, don't get caught on the metaphors. Simply reply, it's about time. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll read, um, I read this, this bit out in, in Bath, I was in Bath, sorry, and, um, <laughs> yeah. is it Bath, like, we're in South well London, well? Bath. Oh, Bath, <laughs> I, I say Bath, that's all right, yeah. Did it go down as well as I thought? You'll see, I, I feel unsafe for Brandon in the top of the <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so it's just an example, so what the book of Christ is examples of the psychosis we have to deal with. Uh, so the, this is chapter four, self-segregation. Um, in August 2019, the British government launched the latest phase of its war against knife crime. They had already wielded the higher power of the state, an increased police presence, ramping up stop and search, and issuing stronger prison sentences for carrying a weapon. Now they decided to try the, dis the diplomacy of soft power, setting aside a million pounds for their knife, hashtag knife free campaign, which aimed to send out positive messages to dissuade young people from carrying knives. Policing Minister Kit Mulhers hoped it would bring home to thousands of young people the tragic consequences of carrying a knife and challenging the idea that it makes you safer. Ignore the cringeworthy trying to be hit old people idea that a hashtag will somehow reach into the souls of young people for a moment. It was a patronizing campaign, one that essentially blamed young people rather than the conditions that they were um, trying to survive. Conditions that made it seem like they had no alternative but to carry a knife. This is the classic conservative personal responsibility nonsense. And funnily enough, this idea, al idea always manages to neglect the responsibility politicians have for improving people's lives. The campaign caused an outrage. More than £57,000 £57, of your money, taxpayers' money, was spent on purchasing 321,000 boxes to replace the standard containers of fried chicken at Chicken Cottage, Dixie Chicken and Morley's, emblazoned with the empowering hashtag knife free messages. No, I am not joking, the government really used fried chicken shops for public service announcements about knife crime. <laughs> if you've ever listened to grime music, you will likely be familiar with the name Morley's. It, it is immortalized in a number of verses. Rest assured, these are the ghettoist of chicken shops. KFC was apparently too upmarket. Public health messaging about the dangers of 99p fried chicken might be warranted, but even I can barely imagine the thought process that led to this racist waste of time and money. <laughs> Picture the meeting when they hit on the idea of unfortunate little Leroy who seeks refuge in the chicken shop and whose attention is wrapped by the knife free hashtag adorning his three piece meal. <laughs> it should terrify but not surprise us that the government relates to the black community through the latest Stormzy album. Mm, thank you. <laughs> few quotes from the book that I wrote and you know I really did reach out to so many different women people that could offer some assistance um, there's so many quotes in here but the one that I think is really fitting for this conversation is a chapter nine it's called creating a community and this is a quote by Kathleen Newman Bremen and it's sometimes working to the brink feels like the only option. And for many black people, it is. But that's where community comes in, or at least it should. So I just wanted to kind of reaffirm that, that it is a community effort. And yeah, we've got this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you'll all agree. Very different, but all incredible excerpts. And I hope that all of you will support these incredible authors um, and buying a copy of their book. I believe they'll all be 
upstairs signing a copy so I hope you'll all support them. So I'm um, aware of the time and knowing that we need to wrap up shortly so I think we only have a time for I think it's two questions um, so I'm, gonna, I'm so sorry but you can feel free to ask more when you go and to the signing and um, so uh, I'm going to open up to the floor now and um, I guess it's whoever shouts loudest gets <laughs> chosen um, do we have a roving mic we do Okay, so would anyone like to uh, ask